Metal Tag 2024, coming up after this intro. Welcome back to Ground Zero Salem. As always, I'm your host, Pat, and it's time for the Metal Tag 2024. It's that time of year again. 20 random questions pertaining to one's collecting habits, uh, listening habits, so on and so forth, specifically in the realms of metal. Uh, Knowing me, I'll probably veer outside a little bit into adjacent genres like hardcore and punk, as I'm wont to do. But these are always fun. I like partaking in these when I can. Normally, the uh, the questions are assembled by uh, the Rock Scout. This year, it's uh, my buddies over at Heavy Metallurgy. I just appeared on a stream last night. Alan and Marty got these together. I think Metal Mickey helped out as well. So shout out to all of them for, for doing this and getting the conversation going. So without further ado, let's get down to brass tacks and hit up question number one to start. Number one, name a release you're eagerly anticipating in 2024. For me, that's uh, the new Sonic Poison EP, Grinded Leftovers. Um, They were high on my list of stuff I enjoyed last year. I talked about them on my Best of Grindcore 2023 uh, Top 10. Just killer repulsion style grind. They've not steered me wrong yet. They haven't made a single misstep, and I'm sure this will be no exception. I thought with the title Grinded Leftovers, it might be a collection of demos or something like that, but I believe it's all... Uh, new stuff. Might be stuff that they haven't recorded yet, but it's all new stuff in the form of an EP. So that that should be cool. Looks like it's coming out on Head Split. Appropriate label for that to debut on. Always love their stuff. Also, Lifeless Dark from Boston. If I think somebody mentioned on Facebook or Instagram that they were recording, if I'm remembering right. If I'm not, strike that from the record. I hope they are. Uh, Lifeless Dark do a really good job of kind of invoking sacrilege and a lot of uh, kind of grimy, crusty, rash sort of stuff. They um, particularly sounding like Sacrilege, but also maybe some early Bolt Thrower, uh, anti sex stuff like that. Um, they had a tape that came out two or three years ago that was really, really good. And their sister band, Innocent, put out a record last year that was excellent. That was more kind of straightforward, DB-ish, raw punk kind of stuff. So hopefully... There will be a, a lifeless dark recording. I'm hoping for a full length, but anything would be really cool because that tape is excellent. Good stuff. Uh, number two, Chinese New Year 2024 is the year of the dragon. Show off an album either inspired by or containing dragons on the cover. Okay. How about just uh, a band called Dragon? Clearly, uh, you know, there's no dragon on the cover, but they're they're called Dragon. So we're gonna go, we're gonna go with uh, just Dragon Polish band, pretty much like straight up thrash metal with death metal vocals, just the two components, just death metal vocals, straight up thrash, good stuff. Uh, this came out on Under One Flag. I think they were one of the earlier Polish thrash metal, death metal, extreme metal, whatever kind of bands to kind of break out of Poland, if I'm remembering right. But yeah late 80s, early 90s, I think, was when this came out. Just picked it up randomly. And, just for extra credit, you know, if I gotta talk about a band that actually has a dragon on the cover, we can go with Azeth through a Warren of Shadow. Great, chaotic, uh, fantasy-themed death metal stuff from California. Really, really cool. Uh, kind of, a lot of the lyrical themes revolve around the Steven Erickson Malazan Book of the Fallen, of Malazan, uh, Saga, it's like 10 books, so nerdy fantasy stuff, 
This could also probably count for the literature one, but I'm not going to get ahead of myself. Sorry to give that away. Uh, dragons. Always love dragons. And dungeons, for that matter. Three, what was your favorite album that you acquired in 2023? Well, I misread this at first as like, what is your album of the year? I had picked the Saren Reaper record, which is excellent. Everybody should listen to it. But I think this was more pertaining to scores and stuff like that. And I didn't really have that many like uh, first press, you know, picked it up in the shop and wanting it forever kind of thing. But I was happy to get this. I always try to pick up these um, new Renaissance comps. Got a couple of them already, but this is one of the, this is a Speed Metal Hell, the first one. Speed Metal Hell compilation. It's got Pap Smear, Vermach, Necropolis from Atlanta, I believe. Uh, Dream Death, Regurgitation, Necrophagia, Blood Feast, Prong. Metal Onslaught, The Kill, and Outrage. So just a great compilation of Rash and Speed Metal on New Renaissance. Classic label that put out a lot of good stuff. That was a great score. Pretty sure I picked that up at Sorry State at some point. I have my paper over my monitor because I have a tendency to look at myself being recorded in OBS and I gotta focus on you folks and talk to you. I have it covered up with the list, but I also need to make sure that there's no glare. It's hard, YouTubing. Okay, it's a very technical thing to process. All right, anyways, number four. Was there a title in 2023 that you were satisfied to purchase digitally, not on physical media, and why? Yes, one that I can think of in particular. And if I may, I'll pull an Allen, pull it up on Bandcamp to show the world, to show you fine people. And that is uh, the disembodied, I don't think it's the full discography, but semi-discography, Transfiguration. I think this originally came out on Double LP. Uh, heavy hardcore band from Minneapolis. Very heavy, very detuned, moshy, crushing hardcore stuff. Very, very good band. Kind of a big inspiration on the new wave of bands like Knock Loose and stuff like that that are pretty prevalent now. But I don't like a ton of stuff like this. This band was classic for this style, though. Kind of helped make metallic hardcore even heavier after bands like Bloodlet and Damnation AD. The first wave of that stuff came out, so I was happy to pick this up. I would love to have the LPs, but they sold out very quickly. I don't even think I could find any copies for sale. I think they were so prohibitively expensive and rare, they just went immediately. So, yeah, digital only. Number five, show an album that musically doesn't match the cover art. So, immediately what sprang to mind when I looked at this topic. This seems to be a fun one that people talk about a lot. Everybody has the story, or at least people of a certain age and generation, have the story about going into the record shop and seeing Nazareth Records, several come to mind, or any kind of 70s boogie rock that used fantasy art. Molly Hatchet's a huge one, obviously, flirting with disaster. Uh, you know, Frazetta art and stuff and being like oh it's, it sounds like like slightly more amplified distorted country music that's a given we all know about that it's an old it's one of the best it's an old chestnut I wanted to think of something a little different so I pulled out this heavy sentence record that I love that came out in I think 2021 it was an album of the year for me then Bang to Rights great record sounds like a straight up uh, collision of Deano era Maiden and Motorhead like Lemmy singing for Deano Era Maiden, pretty much. Twin leads, you know, uh, prominent bass, rough vocals. It's it's awesome. New Wave of British Heavy Metal Worship. But, and maybe it's just me. I mean, this could pass for a metal cover, I'm sure. But it seems way more punk to me. It seems like it'd be like an oi band. I mean, it does look pretty D&D. Like, uh, it almost looks like a, the Wizardry game, the old computer game. Uh, but with like an, I don't know, like an orc. Kind of looks like a cop. And like, this guy with the boots and the helmet. It, it feels very punk to me. I recognize the art style. I think the artist has done punk and hardcore records before. Maybe on stuff on quality control, HQ or something like that. I don't remember where I've seen them, but I don't know. It just feels like a band like, I don't know, it'd be like the, the restarts from the UK or something along those lines. Or I don't know. Anything, anything kind of UK 82 sounding. Or at best, maybe crossover or something. Not not straight up new wave of British heavy metal. So I'm gonna say that. For that topic. Uh, who is a metal artist that you own the most albums by? 
That's an easy one. That would be Motorhead. Speaking of Motorhead, uh, I counted earlier. I have 13 LPs, 11 cassettes, 6 CDs, I think 2 or 3 VHS tapes if I'm remembering right, a couple of DVDs, including one that I can't play because I didn't know it was PAL format, a box set, actually a, a CD box set and an LP box set, come to think of it. It has like the first three albums, them as a three piece in it, great box set. Um, like 10 shirts, <laughs> uh, a big silk flag. I like Motorhead a lot. So I mean, all together, that's what, pushing 30 to 40? I'm bad at math, but something like that. Yeah, that's the one that I had the most by. I did notice that next to, on the shelf, very close to Motorhead was my Morbid Angel collection. And I have way more Morbid Angel than I remember because I have a tendency to buy Morbid Angel bootlegs as much as I possibly can. So I have tons of like live recordings on LP. I have a bunch of tapes that they have a lot of really good, good sounding because they were a tight band when they were in their heyday during altars and all that. So they have a lot of really good uh, recordings. There's demo collections I have too. So I do have, Morbid Angel might be second to that just to, just to say, just to throw that out there, which I didn't even really think about that much. I have more Morbid Angel bootlegs than I do Metallica stuff. And I have, I love collecting early Metallica, Kill 'Em All era Metallica bootlegs. So got a lot of those too, um, but I digress. Seven, show an album that you blind bought in 2023. Don't mind if I do. Talked about this last night on the stream. This is the 2021 full length from Nasty Face from Switzerland. This came out on Head Split here in the US, a couple of different labels on cassette in Europe. Um, really weird, hard to read title here. This is the face wish how. I don't, I don't know what that means. Uh, this is great, nasty, thrashy, mean gore grind. Uh, it's it's gurgly and, and gross, but it's decipherable and catchy. It would go well on as an early 20 years ago release on Razorback. If that gives you any idea. Um, all that, all that kind of gore grindy carcass wor worship that was big on that label at that time, along with other bands like Squash Bowls and stuff like that. It's right, right along those lines. It's very, very good. Um, and I just, I just love the art. It, it's so weird and so kind of disturbing without being blatantly gory. And that's what kind of roped me in. That and the name Nasty Face. Just, how can you not? Come on. Nasty Face. Eight. Show a show a title. I'm trying to engage. <laughs> show a title that you own on more than one format. Okay, that's an easy one. I have a lot of lot of bands in the two or three format club. One that I've shown off a lot is I have everything, every format for Terrorizer, World Downfall, um, several different accused releases I think I have on three formats. This is the first one that sprang to mind, so I'm going to pull this. We've got Napalm Death Scum, utter classic on vinyl, cassette, and dual CD and DVD. All different eras, these were pressed in. Uh, judging by the... F I don't really follow this stuff that closely, but judging by... The fact that this just says Relativity and not Relativity Combat, this probably came out sometime in the mid-90s or got repressed sometime in the mid-90s. I recognize that font of uh, Relativity stuff that came out then. I think that was kind of in the era that all those generic-looking best-ofs came out, like the best of Death, Fate, and the best of Agnostic Front, and Exploited, uh, Apocalypse 77 with like the like just two or three color cover best-ofs. Looks like it came out around the same era, so mid-90s, I think this was pressed. People get really nerdy about Scum. This is, has the purple. I think there's red, reddish, orange, purple, yellow, green, and maybe a few others that I'm forgetting. I don't follow that stuff too closely. I just really like the record. Um, the CD, as I mentioned, CD and DVD, this was along the era of Earache actually putting some effort into like releasing stuff on CD and including bonuses with it. The full five run of the early Carcass discography before they reformed was really cool because it was like two or three CD sets that rolled up together kind of folded together in almost like a, a bookshelf kind of deal and it spelled out Carcass on the spines which was really nice and they all had uh, DVDs with them that were little um, documentaries. This is 
not as fancy, but it does have like a mini documentary on the DVD that is just Mick Harris, if I'm remembering right. It's been years since I've watched it, but from what I remember, it's just Mick Harris like driving around with the person filming and just talking about recording this stuff and, and pointing out places where they played. It's interesting. He's an interesting guy. Um, but yeah, this this I think came out in the late 2000s. And then finally, if I may just stash these over here. Finally, we have this. This is actually a boot. Um, if I see a, an official out in the wild, I'll probably grab it. I'm curious to hear if like the FDR treatment of scum makes any difference. I'm sure it probably doesn't. Maybe it's mastered a little louder or something, but this is a very faithful boot. Um, I don't know what recent pressings of scum look like, uh, those PR reissues. This is pretty faithful. It's got the old the old earache logo right there, which is which is cool. It's got a reproduction of the hype sticker even. Suggested retail price three pound ninety nine pence. Four quid. Um you know the the old uh style center labels are also present, which is really cool. So that's neat to have. Uh, there was a period where Eric wasn't really repressing this stuff on vinyl so much. I want to say like late 2000s um, before the vinyl boom started to kind of take off. I think Back on Black was just starting to reissue stuff and badly at that. And uh, I think Your Mark was another one. There's only a handful of um, labels doing vinyl represses. So Eric stuff was kind of scarce. You could get earlier pressings for cheaper, though. Um, I think I got Utopia Banished, like an original pressing of it for only like 30 bucks at the time. But it was still kind of hard to come by, so there was people booting this stuff. And I got this for cheap, and it, it sounds fine, it sounds good. Nine, Bookworm. Show off a release conceptually inspired by literature. Did uh, Professor Allen come up with this stuff? No, it's a good topic, it's a good topic. Um, so, a couple of things spring to mind with that. I grabbed more than one. Because I, I first thought of one that was perfect, I thought, and then I was like, well, it's not metal. So I'll pick something that's a bit more metal and then something that's almost too perfect. We'll go with uh, that order. The first thing that I picked out and thought of, not a metal band, but certainly adjacent to metal, it has an influence on a lot of metal bands lyrically, image-wise, art-wise. The Immortal Rudimentary Peni, Cacophony, their second LP. Um, this is almost all Lovecraft-inspired, with, I think there's one or two songs that might be Poe-inspired on here. But mostly it's I mean, it's all over it. Night Gaunts is the name of the first song. Horrors in the Museum. Uh, architectonic and Dominant. It's tongue-in-cheek, too, which is fun. Lovecraft Baby. Uh, Beyond the Tenarian Hills. American Anglophile in the World Turned Upside Down. You know, pretty wild stuff. He definitely referenced Love, Lovecraft. Nick Blinko, that is. The guy, chief songwriter. Um, creative mind behind Rudimentary P&I. Certainly referenced Lovecraft plenty before this and after this, but this is the big love letter to Lovecraft. Ah, but life is a boot, and producing ghastly, grisly, ghoulish, and horrifying works of his own, as well as man-eating things which foraged in graveyards, of human beastly crosses which grew beastlier and beastlier as they grew older, of gibbering shoggoths and elder beings which smelt real bad, and were always trying to break through thresholds and take over, ruckus, squamous, amorphous nasties abetted by thin gone New England eccentrics who dwelt in attics and who eventually were never seen or heard from again. Serve them damn well right, I say. In short, how it was a twitch, boys and girls, and that's all there is to it. Um, also, one thing that popped up in my brain, but it's only a couple of songs. This is a compilation of the first two Sacrilege, 12 Inches. Um, Behind the Realms of Madness, I think, is more of a, like a maxi EP or a mini LP. Um, within the prophecies of full length, but, you know, regardless, thrash metal band, like I mentioned, kind of came out of punk. Early stuff was more like discharge -y. This is like filthy thrash kind of stuff that feels kind of crusty too. I think their writing style influenced crust as well. They've got a couple of straight up J.R.R. Tolkien nods and a couple of songs on here. Flight of the Nazgul, uh, Shadow from Mordor. One of those, there's a, like a, there's a J.R.R. Tolkien song on each, on each record there. So that's another thing that came to mind. And then I remembered Blood Hag, which was a Seattle band that was around I don't know, mid-2000s is when this came out, I think. Uh, I don't know if they're gigging anymore. Most recently, I just remembered, and it's not even recent-recent, it was like six years ago, uh, their their singer got briefly famous, internet famous, or at least shown on a, a couple of like news shows and stuff like that for dumping a 
coffee on Alex Jones in downtown Seattle when he was doing his thing yelling about the globalists or whatever. <laughs> the guy, I don't know, the guy had a confrontation with Alex Jones and dumped the coffee on him. Literal slave the system. I just broke. Um, regardless, this is kind of grindy, punkish metal stuff. Uh, you know, it's sort of DIY. It is, it is like heavy, death metal influenced, uh, hardcore punk kind of crust kind of shit. Um, everything is, every single song references a different author. There's a song called Douglas Adams. There's a song called Edgar Allan Poe. There's an Orson Scott Card song, a Franz Kafka song, and it's not even making illusions like every track is just the name of the author uh you know people that i'm not familiar with because i'm not that well read uh jack womack is another one so 16 tracks in all so yeah blood hag blood hog blood hag yeah kind of weirdly crossover grindy stuff i'm not exactly I'm trying to remember exactly what they sound like because it's been a while since i've checked them out but they're they're a fun band and i guess they used to like quiz people and grill people about um about literature during their shows and like throw out books while they're playing and stuff like that. They definitely had a whole shtick going on. So it doesn't get more literary than Blood Hag. Number 10, name a band you'd travel a considerable distance to see in 2024. Um, you know, I've seen all my bucket list bands, most of them. There's bands that I, I don't think I'll ever get a chance to see or that are probably going to call it a day and probably aren't as good as they used to be. I'm not going to get into names here, but the bands that I have seen that I do love that are some of my favorite bands of all time. I've seen DRI count not countless times, but like five or six times by now. I've seen Agnostic Front a bunch of times. I've seen Sheer Terror. I've seen The Accused finally, Accused AD with Blaine, which was awesome. I've seen St. Vitus a handful of times. There's not too much that from like childhood, you know, that gives me the warm fuzzies that I, I, I need to see at this point. I, I saw Bolt Thrower once, which was incredible. Um, I've seen The Damned. You know, I've been very fortunate with catching all these these classic bands. So, I think if I do travel a considerable distance, it'll be bands from overseas that really are deserved of the, the support um, that are new and exciting. Like, I'll, I'll definitely travel to see Sonic Poison, you know, like, at least a couple of hours if they play Richmond or something like that. Um, Undergong, if they make it back over here, I'd, I'd go to see them for sure. I know they're half American at this point, but uh, Cruciamentum, I would love to see again. I saw them at uh, MDF 2013, I want to say, and they were they were awesome, so I traveled to see them. So yeah, those three and anybody else that's like kind of newer and exciting and, and it's making the trek, not like you know the American bands that are constantly touring America that come through your town four or five times a year. It seems like not no diss, you know, respect the hustle, but. I'd be more inclined to see European bands and actually travel for them. Soured Grapes, show a 2023 release that you enthusiastically purchased and but eventually lost interest in. That, I, this I kind of had to scrape for, because I mean, I, I have the attention span of a gnat on Double Espresso when it comes to buying music and listening to stuff. I really should slow down and spend more time with albums, but I say that every year. But one thing where I was like, oh, yeah, I heard this was going to be awesome, and I thought their prior ones were pretty good, but I don't think I'm going to listen to this that much. It's uh, this Moonlight Sorcery full-length, Horned Lord of the Thorned Castle. That's a, that's a mouthful. It's almost like alliteration there. Um, yeah, I I, uh, I couldn't... I, it was very earwormish and catchy, and I liked the prior couple of recordings from this band, but... And I... I have been enjoying the sort of uh, symphonic black metal stuff more and more over the years, kind of learning to reappreciate bands that I used to dig way back when, like uh, Old Man's Child. Of course, I kind of rediscovered the early Cradle of Filth stuff and early Emperor and introduced to old bands for the first time, thanks to Brain Smasher and some other people like Troll and stuff like that. All that stuff is cool. Um, I like synths and black metal sometimes kind of nice that it's coming back because i think it's good to kind of counteract all the other stuff going on with the genre like the really raw stuff and um the atmospheric stuff you know it's kind of nice to hear symphonic uh keyboards and, and black metal that being said this just gets a little too happy go lucky almost like black metal beats dragon force or something like that for me i'm sure it's great for a lot of people but it's just not my thing a couple of listens and then i'm good i'm set um that was 11 Sour Grapes. Number 12, The Golden Child uh, with Eddie Murphy. 
let him ask it. again. Name an artist that you feel can do no wrong. Um, I'm going to interpret the question as this, not as a band, but a musician, a journeyman musician who's been in tons of stuff. I'm going to go ahead and say Jay Styles from many, many bands, currently from Night Feeder, but had his start in Disrupt moved all over the country numerous times, Minneapolis, and now he's in Seattle, back and forth to Boston once or twice, somewhere in there, but played in State of Fear, Chicken Chest and the Bird Boys, um, Death Raid, uh, there's there's one or two more that I'm forgetting, Consume, just a crust-making machine, uh, kind of helped forge the sound of the American version of that, you know, with a lot of extreme noise terror influence as well as Swedish and Finnish hardcore like a lot of Scandinavian hardcore just making this really volatile music for over three decades at this point um, Disruptor classics of the genre kind of helped really forge a path for it in America along with Misery and Destroy and Nausea of course and he's just been at it the whole time using Grief briefly even when half the members of Disrupt split off and you know did the sludge thing um and and night feeder is one of the best things he's done i think it's right up there with disrupt it's it's a bit more gloomy um a little bit more punk sometimes as opposed to approaching really you know bordering on grind kind of crust stuff but it's that signature riff style that he's so excels at and i i think i don't think he has a bad record in his whole whole discography if you want me to give you a, a number two that's like something a little bit more firmly in metal um i'd say shelby Lermo from ulthar and vastum is a fantastic musician i don't think that guy's recorded anything bad either he's got a bunch of other projects that are that are great that he's been involved with as well um so i'd say you know if you want a straight up metal guy probably Sh shelby's your guy but uh the first thing that sprung to mind for me was jay styles so overstayed welcome name a band that you wish would have called a quit when they were ahead I had a lot of trouble with this one. I mean, I'm sure there's plenty of good examples. Um, the first thing that came to mind was Slayer. Like, I, in a fantasy world, I would have wished that they'd stuck around for a pretty long time, but just stopped at Divine Intervention and then just tore it off of everything up to that point and not recorded the albums they did after. The Return to Form albums were okay um, when they were starting to play really fast again, but honestly, I kind of wished, you know, the, the whole... Uh, tattoo head era <laughs> slayer like never really happened the other one that i thought of um you know and this isn't like my favorite of favorites of this style or anything but i thought this record was really fun when it came out uh the first ghost there opus eponymous uh you know this was the era of jex thoth and blood ceremony and all that stuff blowing up and um ghosts were easily the most commercial from all that quote unquote like a occult rock stuff everybody was like it sounds like merciful fate meets oyster cult and like yeah kind of but like not really very surface level versions of both of those and that's fine but it was a great kind of spooky hard rock record i thought it was fun i i, I like a couple of songs on this a lot particularly the one uh elizabeth about elizabeth bathory there um but i definitely don't need anything else by this band <laughs> definitely don't like anything else they've done um yeah, I'll go with the debut and for a bit of fun now and again. There's other stuff that I'd probably reach for it before I reach for this, but I, I think this is an okay record. Definitely don't need anything else. Um, show a band release that you bought in 2023, number 14, as a direct result of watching someone else's YouTube channel. Yeah, um, a lot of people started talking about this after a while, but the first I heard of the Nithing record, Agonal Hymns, was from Melanie, from Melanie Loves Death Metal. Um, I'm constantly giving my my tight buds, props for getting me into a lot of cool stuff, the usual suspects, um, 
and I figured I should I should mention somebody else other than <laughs> Brain Smasher, Eric Bauer, or whatever. Um, yeah, I heard about this from Melanie, and I was like, that sounds really interesting. Um, and I'm not even 100% if it was her channel or if it was her Instagram, but I'm going to count it anyway. It's, uh, yeah, a great, wild, wild, brutal death metal record that is so chaotic and weird. I talk about it at length in my best of black and death metal for 2023 video. So check that out if you haven't yet. <clears throat> Number 15. Show us an otherwise good album that ends up suffering from being too long. Yeah, I had a lot of trouble with this one, too, because I feel like long albums should be long like usually they intend to be if it's like a doom metal record what i mean is like doom metal records some epic kind of black metal stuff it's going to be longer um i feel like sometimes death metal records get a little bit too repetitive especially if they're over 40 minutes or so they can get a little a little bit too much need to be truncated down slightly the first thing i grabbed was a recent purchase that i thought of and maybe it's just i just can't get into this band i like the last full length I believe it was the last anyway full length from negative plane which was stained glass reflections i think it was called <clears throat> this one um the pact I, is their most recent and something about like the trebliness of it and the the thinness like deliberate thinness of the the sound and i just got kind of just my eyes glazed over with this one a couple of songs were good but i wasn't really feeling the overall sound so that's my that pick for this just off the top of my head uh, feels too long. It's an hour, you know. It's not insanely long or anything, but it it kind of just I couldn't pay attention to it. Yeah, first couple songs were pretty decent, but favorite band T-shirt, um, sentimental favorite. Not necessarily the coolest looking, although it is very cool looking, but one that I've had forever since I believe 1998 or so. This lovely crap creator out of the dark into the light shirt, as you can see here. It's been damaged by bleach, not in the cool, trendy way <laughs> on the back. I think I bleached my hair at some point. I don't even know. I used to bleach my hair and dye it weird colors and stuff uh, back in the day when I was super punk. I don't know if that's what that's from or if I maybe it just got bleach spilled on it. I don't remember. There's a little bit of paint on it as well. It's very well loved. It kind of sucks because the rest of the shirt is... I have other shirts that are similarly as old and they are like completely like cheesecloth, like tons of holes. This actually is held up pretty well, except for around the collar there, which I, I might bust out the needle and thread and uh, and fix that up at some point. But I got this at the House of Guitars in Rochester, New York. Um, haven't been there in years. It's still going. It's kind of a legendary stop. A lot of musicians stop through there. Rochester is a very metal town for such a small town. And Dan Wilker lives there now. I think Kill 'Em All was recorded there. So a lot of touring bands have all like signed the wall, all those thrash metal bands and stuff. It's kind of a legendary place, worth checking out if you happen to be traveling through there. But and I'm sure it's not like this now because I mean alone if I threw this on Depop, even with it being thrashed, I'd probably get 150 bucks for it or something. Um, but it used to be in around the time that I bought it at the end of the century, nobody cared about thrash metal, um, nobody cared about hair metal, none of that stuff was retro yet. And I believe I purchased that shirt for like $3 and they weren't even on racks. I don't know what kind of people were in there just acting like total animals, but like there were racks, but you were just, none of the shirts were on them for the most part. You were just kind of waiting ankle deep in concert shirts. And it wasn't just metal either. It was, you'd see like fat boys, like baseball, satin baseball jackets and all this cool stuff. My friend got a really sweet, like later era, angry Samoans shirt from there. Um, but one particular trip, I got that shirt, that creator shirt. My friend got the Angry Samoan shirt. I got a white Martha Sucks Brains, uh, Martha Splatterhead, Mattis Stores Ever Told shirt, and a really cool Nuclear Assault shirt that looks like, almost looks like, it's like the Nuclear Assault logo, but it's all chrome and metallic, and the reflected in the logo, it looks like a, like a flight simulator, like Nintendo game. It's like a some some like airplane sights and dials and stuff. It's It's very cheesy looking but awesome and that that all that is definitely paper thin and, and rotting basically so yeah i have fond memories of that shirt i used to live in it i wore it all the time um the the yeah the nuclear assault shirt has been pretty much retired at this point and the uh, the accused shirt i wore when i was traveling in europe for months on end and it pretty much just like completely disintegrated so yeah favorite shirts good stuff share a band that has been around for at least 24 years that you think is still going strong and creatively relevant 
I think there's other examples of this that would be pretty good. I think Master is a good example of like, you know, he's just that dude's just still at it, still doing a great job, um, killing it. But the thing that first thing that popped up for me in my brain, and I think it's close enough that, or adjacent enough to metal, it's fine, is Tragedy. And I believe they started right in 2000. Um, it might have been 2001. I'm gonna count it anyway. Bang count it. Um, they you know, transitioned out of His Hero Is Gone around that time, and they're still going in one form or another. They don't play super often. They came out with, I think, like a, a mini LP, I want to say only like two years ago or three years ago, but just a cr- crushing apocalyptic, crusty hardcore, very, very heavy, a lot of melodic leads, <laughs> manages to feel extremely epic, but with really short songs, really just pummeling, pummeling rhythms, uh, kind of deeper and higher vocals trading off, but not like super exaggerated, like disrupt or extreme noise terror. Just a, a, a force to be reckoned with. Um, it always stuck to their DIY principles. A lot of lyrics that they wrote then and now that are still relevant about technology evolving past our ability to control it, government overreach, um, rise of fascism in the Western world, all that kind of stuff. They were singing about that 20 years ago, and it's even more even more appropriate today. Um, so, yeah, great band. And all their related bands are really good, too. Uh, Todd Burdett's Project Nightfell is, is excellent, like way more of like a, almost like a doom metal thing. Really excellent band. Great writers. A lot of great related projects. Uh, my favorite band mascot should come as no surprise to anybody that knows me is Martha Splatterhead. This is a cool little item. This is the uh, Martha Splatterhead comic book. This comes with a, a free flexi disc, which is neat. This is my nice, nice copy of it. It's like preserved and backed and boarded. I have a, a more beat up copy too, like in my comic box and lots of different comic artists showing their interpretations of Martha, who is this, you know, this zombie slasher mascot she adorned the cover of like all their metal stuff anyway i think she was originally envisioned by tommy niemeyer the guitarist but yeah she's had a lot of different interpretations peter bag does a story in this which is great he was a very iconic uh comic guy and that was more prevalent in the 90s that did hate comics certainly very representative of 90s culture slacker culture and seattle and all that kind of stuff you'd certainly recognize his art style if uh if you saw it everybody's super bendy and wiggly looking but yeah uh martha splatterhead all day favorite mascot horse um i also really like the exodus kid i think people forget about the exodus kid the little goofy thrasher kid with like the half shaved head grab bag share a random poll from your collection no peeking you have things alphabetized but pride Oh, okay. Social Circle. Cool uh, hardcore punk band from Boston. A bunch of friends of mine played in this band. They were around from 2001 or 2 till about 2008. I could be wrong with that. But um, yeah, they were kind of a mix of 80s hardcore and, and garagey snotty kind of, like almost like 77 punk and 80s hardcore together. Like they had a a snotty delivery vocally and kind of catchy guitar stuff, but it was very hyped up and fast and angry and like hardcore. Um, there's kind of a couple of bands that were doing that during the time. Career Suicide from Canada being a big one to do that style, but Social Circle did it really well. Um, they had a, some great players in the band. Ryan, the drummer, actually went on to do lots of stuff, but he currently has been playing, I believe, in Innocent and Lifeless Dark, speaking of that. So yeah, full circle, full social circle. Great LP, I should throw this on. I haven't listened to it in forever. They were always really good live too. Show an album from a metal band that others may not consider metal. Uh, I'm gonna go with Hometown Boys on this one. Earth Crisis Destroyed the Machines. Certainly coming from a cultural standpoint and lyrically they come from hardcore. I think as far as their musical ability goes and the production on this and the riffs, this is way more firmly in metal um it was produced by kurt from believer and jim winters who helped write some of the music and i think played on this 
as well, um, at least in parts. And I think he played some shows. I don't think he was a permanent member, but played Nurse Crisis for a while. Um, big step up from the Firestorm EP, which was great, but f the Firestorm EP was kind of of the flavor of uh, a lot of new age record stuff that came out at the time and uh, bands like Chokehold, where it was a lot of heavy, percussive, palm muted E chords over and over again, kind of creating tension and then weaving in little riff bits between the all the stomp parts. It was very like, you know, rage inducing kind of stuff. They really upped their game with this with like kind of fleshing out I wouldn't say more real riffs, but stuff that was a little bit more um, more thought out, you know, in terms of song structures and, and things like that. And they got even like more progressive on the next one, Gamora's Seasons Ends, which a lot of the riffs on that almost seem like they're reaching for like a death human kind of deal or something. But yeah, I mean, as far as their message and everything and what they were singing about, definitely punk rock, hardcore, environmental, social commentary sort of stuff. But musically, I mean, it's it's very much some form of metal to me. They were definitely inspired by a lot of heavier stuff going on, a lot of death metal, thrash metal, stuff like that. Just rhythmically, I, they were doing their own thing with it and making it a little bit more percussive and mid-paced and, and um, kind of the punch, punch in the gut, moshy kind of style. But yeah, very iconic band, very influential band. Grew up seeing them every weekend. So I'm gonna mention that. I'd say there'd be some other mentions within Hardcore too. Um, a couple other ones that I thought of that I was like, nah, I'll just go with Earth Crisis. But I think the second cro album, Best Wishes, is like, people talk about it like it's a, like a crossover record. It doesn't, it's not like it's a Cryptic Slaughter style or DRI or anything. Like, it's pretty much just Harley trying to do his take on Metallica. And I think it's a good, it's a good end product, really. But I, I mean, that to me is, is pretty much straight up like a, a thrash or speed metal record with a little bit of New York hardcore flavor and um kind of the same thing with leeway um born to expire great record sounds like a, a much less cheesy anthrax to me um you know uh, eddie sutton sounds definitely like a metal vocalist he sounds like talented enough where he could do other styles of music and i know he i'm pretty sure that guy's into like r&b and stuff like that but the his delivery is very very metal like a non-cheesy version of metal um not a metal guy either he's like a like a hip-hop dude uh, b-boy type of hardcore kid like one of the ogs for that style um but i feel like that born to expire record kind of crossover flavored but very much sounds like a like a thrash metal record to me so i think those are examples of metal records by bands that came from punk and hardcore that might not all be metal people or you know something along those lines so that's about it um yeah so time to edit this down as always i'll be seeing you folks hopefully in another week I hope everybody has a good rest of their weekend. Um, thanks to everybody who watched the stream last night, by the way. People bought a few things from my distro, got a couple new subs. Always appreciated. If you're not subbed to the channel uh, and you enjoy what you're seeing, it really helps the channel out. If you can click the subscribe button down there, click the bell too, so you know when my new updates are up. Right now, I have about 40% of my viewers aren't subscribed. So I'd like to get that up to maybe half that. That would be... That'd be killer. Um, thanks to all the new supporters. And that's about it. Pad GZS out. Have a good afternoon, night, morning, weekend, or weekday. Bye.